I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. World War I, a 100 years ago, the beginning of a catastrophe that breaks and shatters and curses Europe and the globe for the last 100 years. But at the close, what is striking in the last months of the war is how it ended. We know how it started. We know that it was mobilizations and competing militarism versus kingship. But the close of the war has long been a mystery to me, and now it's solved thanks to a new book, 100 Days, the campaign that ended World War I. Nick Lloyd is the author. He joins me now from London, where he is senior lecturer in defense studies at King's College London. Nick, Professor, a very good evening to you. Thank you for this. Before we plunge into the generals and their conferences, pouring over maps at Chateau and the Kaiser and his anxiety and defensiveness, this is a personal story for you and your family because you lost your great uncle in the last days of the war at a, a battle called Canal du Nord. He was part of the British Expeditionary Force. Who was he and what do we know about his death? Good evening to you. Good evening, John. Um, he was, uh, his name was Tom Cottrell. He was a private. He uh, was conscripted in, uh, we think, the summer of 1917 um, and found himself on the Western Front um, a year later, um, about to take part in what will become the last great campaign of the First World War. Um, we, we know relatively little about him. He came home on leave um, that summer where my, uh, my late grandmother she, she was very young at the time, um, met him. I don't think she could remember meeting him. But anyway, he he returns back to the Western Front and is killed. Now, he's killed um, on the 27th of September, 1918. Um, and he was only 19 years old. So that, that loss always haunted my grandmother and indeed haunted the family. He's buried in France. You have a picture in your book of his grave. Have you visited yeah, we, we've been a few times. Uh, it's a very small cemetery um, outside this little village of Neuville Bourgeonval, um, southeast of Arras. Um, it's it's a, you know like many of these places, it's very poignant, uh, um, and it's it was really remarkable seeing it for the first time to think that he had he had gone all that way and uh, unfortunately never never quite made it to the very end. He served in a unit called the 15th Battalion Royal Warwickshire Regiment uh, with the British, 5th British Division. Uh, what, it, what was the quality of the units at this time? Were these recruits? Were these well-trained troops? I know that you make a very careful case that the French and the British were running out of troops and the Germans had long since run out of soldiers. That's why the Americans were so fresh to the field. Did your great-uncle get good training? Did he have good weapons? Well, he had good weapon. He had a um, short magazine, Lee Enfield rifle, which is probably one of the certainly one of the greatest rifles that's ever been made. Um, they have the Mills bomb, which is a very effective hand grenade. So in terms of equipment, it's, it's pretty good. Um, training is, is okay at this stage of the war. Um, the British Army, by this point, there are some regulars from pre-war regulars around, but the vast majority have been killed or, or promoted much higher up the ranks. So the, the Army is a mixture of um, volunteers from 1914, some territorials and reservists, but the bulk of the soldiers in 1918 are conscripts like Tom, and they're actually quite young. They call it the men of 18 in 1918. Forever 19, Tom, we go now to the commanders who conceived the last months of the war, and in their plans is Tom's death, along with hundreds of thousands of young men, hundreds of thousands. The scale of the first war is difficult to imagine. Even the second war doesn't match the slaughter that happened within days and hours of the launch of an offensive. We go to a chateau at a place called Bon, a Chateau de Bonbon. This is the headquarters of a man named Foch, who serves as the overall commander of the combined forces, the British, the Belgians, and the Americans, and the French. His personality is vital to understand, because serving under him is Patin, who is head of the French forces, Haig, head of the British, and Pershing, most especially, 
uh, the fresh men on the field, 250,000 Americans arriving per month. This is the summer of 1918. The expectation is that the war will last at least another year, perhaps two years. Churchill back home is preparing weapon systems because they're running out of men on the front. And they don't believe they can launch an offensive and win this year because they've been bogged down for years in trench warfare and in competing barrages. Nick, this meeting... Foch lays out what you describe as a battle plan, fresh battle plan. What's new about it? What does he say to these generals that inspire them that they can that they can win the next battle? Well, obviously, they're, they're trying to work out what to do after you've had this. Um, there was a, a series of German offensives during the spring. The final German offensive is on the Marne, which doesn't do very well. The Allies counterattack on the 18th of July. Um, and now on the 24th of July, Foch gathers the commanders together and tries to work out what to do next, primarily to maintain the initiative to keep the Germans on the back foot. Um, at this point, he has no inkling of what is about to happen and how deep the rot has set into the German army. Um, so really what he wants to do is, is keep the pressure on the front, secure um, particularly rail hubs. There's a rail hub at Amiens that's under pressure, and that's a key rail hub certainly for the British. Um, Samuel, they want to put pressure there. So it's about maintaining pressure on the German army, getting key locations, and primarily maintaining the initiative. Uh, Nick mentions the two places that are going to be critical in these next weeks for the offensive, Amiens, the railhead, and that will be the first battle. But before we go there, the success of the Allies at Amiens sets up the order of battle and the weapon systems that break the German resistance all along from the vast battlefield in the north in Belgium, stretching all the way down to the, the to Verdun in France. The, the personalities, Nick, are vivid. Haig. Haig is the commander of the British Expeditionary Force. However, you emphasize that the British Prime Minister Lloyd George hates him. Why? Well, Lloyd George um, never really wants to fight on the Western Front. He wants to fight anywhere else pretty much than that because he thinks it's it's too hard. The Germans are not going to be defeated. And primarily he thinks Haig is a butcher. He thinks Haig is a man who has uh, squandered the, the lives of too many British soldiers. So um, Lloyd George is really consistently undermining Haig um, and doesn't really want to give him any more men because he fears that if he gives him the more men, uh, they'll just become casualties. So it's this huge civil military disruption or fracture in Britain at this point uh, between a commander in chief who just wants to keep battering away at the line and a prime minister that really wants to do anything but that, but feels he can't muster up the enough, enough power to get rid of Haig. So there's exhaustion at home, and Haig is aware of that, and Lloyd George is aware of it, but they're balanced at this point. A victory or defeat on the battlefield could turn one man or the other in superior, uh, uh, in superior form. Foch you describe as inspirational, but Pétain, the man who will go on to infamy in the Second War because of his political considerations, you describe as earthier. What is their relationship, a French generalissimo and a French generalissimo? Well, obviously, um, Foch is a man who has been for many years committed to the offensive as an idea in the French army, um, wants to attack, is, if you like, more of an Eisenhower type figure um, in terms of, you know, trying to encourage his subordinates, keep them going, give them broad directions, but um, but that's it. Pétain, as commander in chief of the French army, um, is primarily indeed solely concerned with keeping his army going because by the summer of 1918, the French are quite literally on their last legs. They, they have no reserves. Um, the troops will not be pushed hard. Um, and Pétain is just about saving enough of the army um, for uh, possibly into 1919. Um, Pétain is a man who has never particularly been an advocate of the offensive and his career suffers from that earlier on. Uh, in his career and earlier on in the war. Um, but as the French army is battered um, and fails to attack or fails to win battles on the Western Front, Pétain is turned to as the man um, who seemed to understand the Western Front better than any other French commander. The troops love him. They recognize that he is a man who is who will look after them, who won't squander their lives. So Pétain has that natural feeling for the Western Front in a way that perhaps Foch doesn't. Um, but really, 
Fosh's time has come now. He is the man with that drive and determination is just what you need at this point. Right. Keep attacking, keep attacking, keep advancing, attack, attack, attack. The fourth general that's important here is Pershing, and we'll speak of him later when the Americans go into the offensive because that's an unknown at this point. The Americans, Pershing and Wilson, have both stayed back, refused to be recruiter, uh, recruiting depots for the British Army. They've trained on their own, and they're pouring into the battlefield, a quarter of a million per month. There's a very large army, but it's untested. It's going to be using French weapons and British and French tactics, and we'll join them momentarily. When we come back, we're going to turn to Amiens, the first offensive that Foch launches. And the order of battle is critical here because this is the airland battle of the 21st century putting itself together for the first time with tanks, with aircraft, with artillery, and coordination between all those units using the radio or the wires at the time. They didn't have wireless radio as we understand it. Uh, the book is 100 Days, The Last 100 Days of the War. It has a surprising twist, but right now, hundreds of thousands of casualties to win battles. The campaign that ended World War I, Nick Lloyd, I'm John Batchelor. John Batchelor, this is the John Batchelor Show. 8 August, 10 August, 1918. It begins at 4.20 a.m., 8 August. That's the moment that the barrage lights up the sky. They describe it variously in Nick Lloyd's new book, 100 Days, as hell lighting up. That you can look at fireworks in the distance. The pounding, all, everybody waiting to go over the top or to advance is awed by it. It humbles people. But at the same time, there's an innovation here that has been ordered by the commanders uh, in their planning for the final offensive against the Germans. Amiens is a rail junction, but most importantly, the British 4th, the French 1st, are up against Marwitz's German 2nd. And the Canadians and Australians are also fighting here, the Dominion troops under the General Curry and Monash. But here's what I learned from Nick Lloyd. The barrage is very short, Nick. Why? Well, primarily they have, they've after many years of development, they've actually worked out the system where they, um, in terms of firing off the map, as it's called, where they, um, they don't need to have the lengthy preliminary bombardment that you'd had on the Western Front. Um, you can actually just fire off um, without alerting the enemy to the long four or five day preliminary bombardment. Um, everyone's much better trained. The artillery is much better at this point, so they can actually. Um, use firepower with surprise. They call it a creeping barrage. How does it work? If I'm in the front lines, an infantryman advancing with tanks, what do I see in front of me? Well, you'll just see a... It'll be like a dusty sort of cloud that will just move. It's so, sometimes... Um, uh, it's sometimes seen as a kind of um, lawnmower, if you will. It just goes ahead at a, at a rate that's... Um, almost perfectly calibrated to the speed of the infantry across the ground. So you will follow within maybe 100, 200 yards of this moving wall of shell fire. Some troops can get within 50 yards, but of course that um, that takes an awful amount of courage and very, very good training and, of course, a great deal of trust in the artillery. Um, so primarily you will follow this wall of shell fire um, interspersed with smoke, um, uh, you will just follow it over the objectives. It will walk you onto your objectives. A couple of weapon systems show up here because the idea is to keep the Germans in their trenches, in their redoubts, not popping up to use their machine guns or counter or fire back with their uh, count, their batteries. Uh, the weapon systems uh, amazingly have arrived on the battlefield in great number. First, the tank. Is this the first big battle of using the tank effectively to go in front of the infantry and roll over the machine guns? Um, well, usually the first uh, mass use of tanks is the Battle of Cambrai in the autumn of 1917, where the British 
It's effectively a large raid on the Hindenburg Line, uh, where many of these techniques are pioneered, bringing the tanks up in secret and then pushing them forward without the barrage. Um, Amion is where it's used more effectively. It's used... Um, Often there's a, there's a new variety of tank called the Mark V, which is faster and more efficient than its predecessor, the Mark IV. Um, and it's, more, it's integrated better in terms of the overall planning. Um, but this is still um, state-of-the-art stuff. There's no question about it. The aircraft, many aircraft, they overwhelm the German aircraft at the time. And the aircraft, uh, despite the fact that the bombs were very small and the machine guns were not effective firing to the ground, they could just sort of area weather w- weapons. What, what I learned from you is that it kept the Germans uh, uneasy and chased them when they, tried to go, when they tried to use the roads or to reinforce the front trenches. Yeah, this is something you, you see a lot of in the accounts of German soldiers in this part of 1918. There's a, a real sense that they've, the, certainly the German Air Force is losing control of the air. Um, they don't have enough aircraft. They don't have enough fuel. The pilots are being killed off. So the Allies have an ability to put aircraft over the battlefield. And, of course, pilots go low searching for targets of opportunity. And, of course, this produces absolute panic and havoc amongst German um, either German front troops or German reserves moving up. And they're almost always, as they near the battlefield, coming under air attack. Um, and it's very similar to something like Normandy in 1944. It absolutely produces um, a sort of paralysis in the German army. The attack bogs down eventually because moving the equipment and the material you need, shells, weapons, uh, resupply, forward is difficult in 1918. But from 8 to 10 August, it breaks through a huge advance and cracks the German 2nd Army and the German 18th Army. At this point, this Amiens battle, this battlefield combination of the creeping barrage, the sudden barrage at 4.20 to 5 a.m. in the morning, the infantry going with tanks, the aircraft pestering and hanging over the Germans as they resupply, breaks down the German defense in depth. That's always worked in the Western Front, but Nick makes the point that one of the reasons it breaks down is they didn't have as many troops or first-grade troops as they had in 17, 16, and 15. Now let's go to the Germans as they see this uh, success in Amiens. We go now to Spa. It's a town in Belgium, to the east of Belgium. Hotel Britannique, of all the ironies, that's the headquarters of the German High Command. The Kaiser has a chateau in Spa as well. The two principals here are Paul von Hindenburg, the absolute commander Prussia, of the Prussian military, and his quartermaster general, a man named Erich von Ludendorff. Who is Hindenburg and Ludendorff at this time? What do they represent to the, to the war effort, Nick? Well, they are the um, sometimes been called the silent dictatorship or the great duo. They are the men that, um, I mean, Hindenburg is, if you like, the nominal head, um, but his chief of staff, the main um, data, the person who does the day-to-day running the army is Ludendorff. He's the power behind the throne, if you will. Um, the Kaiser, of course, has an important role, but he's, he's really been sidelined. Um, by these duo, and when we, now we've identified the three names that we'll go into in depth as the German people and the German army crack under the pressure of the Allied offensive. The book is 100 Days, the, the campaign that ended World War I. Nick Lloyd is the author. I'm John Batchelor. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Into the Hotel Britannique with Nick Lloyd, the author, author of 100 Days. I've seen photographs of it, Nick, and it is not very impressive, although it looks like a, a, like a Marriott with, uh, with, you know, with gables and sort of French dome architecture. But I can imagine the German general staff inside with the Kaiser always in attendance or the crown prince or the other sons of the Kaiser, the Hohenzollern, are hanging around it. And Hindenburg and Ludendorff at the center of it. They see the success at Amiens. You emphasize that at this point, Ludendorff's personality, his energy, 
but also his brittleness are important. What's happening to Ludendorff? What does he see and what does it do to him? Well, Ludendorff is the sort of apostle of the offensive and he has wanted to destroy the Allied armies on the Western Front. He's tried to do it in the spring. He's a very intelligent man. He is a man of great energy, but of course, as you say, he is very brittle. And as it becomes clear that he's not being, he's not getting his way, the Allies are not breaking, the Allies are not going anywhere, and his grand dreams of, of, of winning total decisive victory in the field are fading, um, he simply can't take it. He can't um, process the information. Uh, he can never accept this. It's simply unacceptable to his mind. And, of course, therefore, you, you, you begin to start to see character traits that come out that are, um, um, you know, unacceptable. He's, he becomes very aggressive. He shouts at his subordinates. He micromanages everything um, and really starts to lose control. He's a control freak who is now not able to control things. These are the Prussians. That's different than being the Germans. That was a distinction that was important in 1914 to 1918, especially since later on we'll see generals enter who are not Prussians. What did that mean to be a Prussian general, 1918? Well, obviously Prussia is um, a state of Germany, but Prussia was of the northern part of Germany that took over most of the other parts of what will become Germany um, with a very... Um, unique way of uh, organizing itself in terms of its army. So the, the army and the idea of service in the Prussian army dominates what will become the German army. Um, the idea of militarism, the idea of service to a Kaiser, the idea of um, absolutely everything must be, must serve tactical military efficiency is a very Prussian idea. And of course Ludendorff, if you will, Certainly Ludendorff and Hindenburg seem to embody this idea of Prussian iron will. Um, Hindenburg is sometimes called the, um, the wooden titan, this sort of extremely um, strong military leader. Um, and Prussia is um, the part of Germany that, in, in some cases, many other parts of Germany really dislike. And, of course, there's incidences of 1918 of Bavarians from the south and Prussians fighting each other in the streets as the German army breaks down almost into its constituent parts. Uh, Foch is going to continue the offensive whether the Germans are ready for it or not, whether the Prussians are ready, whether they can manage this. And Foch knows that he's just going to attack uh, in the south, in the center, and the north. The next note I have is the assault on Mont Saint Quentin, and led by the Australian Fifth Brigade. This is Monash, which uh, which capture, captures five hundred Australians, capture or six hundred Australians capture five hundred and fifty Germans in the Kaiser Alexander Regiment, and this flabbergasts the uh, commanders back in Bonbon. They it flabbergasts Haig and and Foch. Why? The Australians fought very well, but what's significant about five or six hundred men capturing five hundred and fifty? Well, it's it's really an indication of how quickly the German army is beginning to cr crumble. Mont Saint-Quentin commands the town of Peron, um, uh, and it's a very, very strongly held defensive position. Um, yet the Australians, using infantry tactics, they're aggressive, they're innovative, managed to take this, um, which means that the hold that the German Second Army has on the line of the Somme are in Peron is now gone, so they have to retreat further. Um, so this really illustrates, and it becomes clear to Foch, that he needs to have plans in place for something, go, you know, success happening more and more like this, um, and the fact that the German army is maybe breaking up quicker than they had anticipated. That's right, why I think right. that is an important point, because it illustrates that the quality of even supposedly elite German troops is now really on the wane. Right. The numbers don't tell you, so we'll go into the specifics, but the 17th, 2nd, 18th, and 9th Army, German armies, between uh, by early September had lost 100,000 men since, uh, since the Amiens Offensive in, uh, in August. So the fall away here is all casualties, killed, wounded, and uh, captured. All casualties are piling up. But why? 
there's a, there's a moment that captures all of it. The Germans are eating potatoes they're digging out of the ground, but they're green potatoes. What does that tell us? What do you mean by that fact, Nick? Well, obviously, the German uh, people have been under a royal naval blockade since 1914, um, which means, obviously, they can't import anything by sea. Um, food is running out. Food is extremely uh, scarce on the home front. It has been uh, has been for, for quite bad since at least the winter of 1617, so-called turnip winter. Um, and this, of course, produces weakness. It produces um, debilitating effects on... Um, the German population and even the army, which is shielded from that and which is given the supplies that, that are available. Um, but this really produces a gradual weakening. And what we see in the summer is that um, because a lot of troops are weaker, they're tired, they don't have the nutrition, the calories they need, they're more vulnerable to disease and things like the Spanish influenza right, pandemic, right, right, which particularly right. in the summer is absolutely devastating to the German army. Right. There are two versions I learned from you. There's a flu you recover from, and then there's the killer flu that will come later in the fall. Is the recovery flu at this point, is it sweeping through the ranks? It is. It's sweeping through the ranks, indeed, of all the armies. Um, but the British soldiers, uh, and often the French soldiers, the Americans are, um, they, they have more calories, the supplies are right. better, they are able to have the food they, they need. Um, in some ways, the, the Allies are um, stocked quite lavishly, certainly compared to the Germans. Um, so clearly, not everyone is dying in the summer, but the, the flu weakens already weakened troops. Um, and it means they take weeks, if not months, to really get back to full fitness, if at all. Um, and so just large sections of the German army may have recovered from the flu, but they are in really no position to, um, to continue to maintain peak physical, physical effectiveness during the autumn and then into the winter of 1918. Nick provides lots of quotes from letters back home from the Germans, from the British, from the French, and the Americans, and especially the, Brit uh, the Germans noting the mood or the morale in the army as they fall back, and dominated by these words, shirkers, rumors, and panic. Uh, gas, we need to mention that. 27% of the American casualties in the first war, I learned from Nick, were from gas, especially mustard gas. And the Germans use it heavily now as it's an area weapon to deny the advances that the uh, Allies are launching. No longer fixed positions, but everybody's moving back. What did mustard gas do to you? It didn't seem to kill you outright, Nick. Um, obviously, it could do, but primarily it was an irritant. So if you got it, if you got it on certain parts of your body, if it splashed, it's a liquid that um, um, it would produce horrendous blisters um, that were obviously um, someone described as frantic in their effect. Um, if you ingested, if it went into the lungs, it would obviously uh, produce uh, could produce pneumonia or produces a sort of um, liquid filling the lungs. So it could be in certain doses, lethal in that sense. Um, it's an absolutely awful chemical compound. It's, if you read accounts of the First World War, the soldiers involved will always, pretty much always say the worst thing was the mustard gas. Right. It, was, it was something that perhaps it was not as lethal as artillery shell fire or machine gun fire, but it was something that they felt instinctively was, was wrong. It was just not right. Um, and it settled in hollows or in trenches, and it could lay... Um, still active for, for days and weeks on end. So if you went into an area that perhaps hadn't been shelled for a while, um, you could still you would still find this chemical compound on you. Um, and then, of course, it would it would cause these blisters and these um, these horrendous skin lesions. Yes, it smelled like burnt wool was the feeling you got if you went into the area. Not everybody had first-rate equipment. Surprisingly, the Americans didn't have as good a gas equipment or good gas protocol as the British, uh, perhaps because they didn't do the training the British had had all these years. Uh, we need to launch the Americans, but uh, uh, before we do, I want to mention the conference at Avenay. Avenay. Luden, this is Ludendorff again, 6 September. At this point, he gathers the chiefs of staffs of three army groups, and he orders them to hold ground at all costs. What's so striking about this, Nick, is that's the same thing we'll see Hitler order the German army in Russia in 1942. Do we know, did Hitler do this consciously? Did he know that Ludendorff, in losing his, his composure in World War I, created conditions that led to slaughter and defeat? 
I, I'm not sure if Hitler's doing exactly the same thing as Ludendorff, or, or certainly in the knowledge of it, but it is a very similar reaction. I think it's a more of an indication that Ludendorff is losing control, right. um, and so he simply shouts his dick commanders down and tells them to you know, hold ground at all costs, which is really, um, it's against his training as an officer, it's against the way that the Germans have, have um, at least since the since 1917, pioneered defense in depth and flexible use of counterattack formations. Um, but he, is, he simply almost cannot accept that the, the front is crumbling so fast um, that he, he begins to suspect that he is surrounded by enemies or traitors or that commanders are not good enough. So he starts sacking uh, officers left, right, and center. He sacks the commander of the Second Army, who was, a t- who was a badly destroyed um, at Amiens. Um, Mar- Marwitz is sacked, but then he's given the Musagon. Yeah, he, well, he's sent to a quiet part of the front. Which is about to become the American ordeal. We're going to turn to the Americans just quickly here because Foch gives the Americans an assignment that is not impossible. The first assignment is Saint-Mail, a summer all of the 1st Division, Lejeune of the 2nd Division, the highest-ranking Marine at the time, under Pershing. This is the 1st American Army. They jump off at 5 a.m., 12 September 1918. These are fresh troops to the fight. How do they do, Nick? Well, they do very well. Um, they're able to overrun the German positions. The German positions are in a salient, so they're overlooked by three sides. So the Allies are uh, the, the, the American troops. The, there's some French troops as well, but a lot of French artillery. Um, they're able to deluge the uh, the target area, uh, destroy all the barbed wire, um, and attack very very quickly. It's sort of like a pincer movement. Um, so Samuel is a is a great success, and certainly the Americans, certainly Pershing, trumpet it as the proof of the inherent aggressiveness, the inherent um, spirit of the Americans that are now on the Western Front. It's a statement, it's a headline, and boy, does it work. It works, and Wilson celebrates, so do the American newspapers. It's not a true picture of the battlefield. We'll turn to that next, when the Americans attack in the area known as the Musargon and meet the Germans at their best. Barbed wire, machine gun positions, and the famous Lost Battalion. 100 Days is the book, the campaign that ended World War I. Nick Lloyd is the author. I'm John Batchelor. John Batchelor, this is the John Batchelor Show. Nick Lloyd is here. We are following the last weeks of the First World War, and it ends very badly. It ends in collapse of Germany. It ends in conditions that create a failed state of Germany, and we know for the rest of the century that failed state will create catastrophes for Europe and for the planet. But right now, and Nick follows one particular a young soldier. He's 29 years old. His name is Adolf Hitler. He serves in a battalion, a regiment, that is uh, used in the north against the Brits, I think, and against the French, but he's gassed very badly, so he's not in at the finish. He's gassed. He's hit with mustard gas, and Nick will follow him through, but right now we have to turn to the Americans. They move the Americans from their success at Samuel to the Meuse-Argonne, and the jump-off uh, tells the Americans that this will not go well. What happens in the Meuse Argonne? What are the conditions that the Americans attack? Well, they're aiming at driving north to seize the city of Sedan. Um, so they'll cut off German troops to the west and north. So, in terms of strategical objectives, it's very important. The only problem is the Meuse Argonne is is awful, awful ground. It's hilly, uh, forested. It's re- regarded as being impassable. Uh, the French think. That there's no way you can drive forward into this terrain. Um, but it is considered that actually the Germans will have to fight here so that they can actually drive north, engage the German army, and then, uh, if you like, drive a dagger right up in, into the heart of that Western Front and actually completely cause the, or completely threaten um, the whole Western Front position of, of the German army. 
there's a position known as Mont Falcon. That's the forest of Mont Falcon. What happens there, Nick? Well, this is regarded as the, it's sometimes called the kind of little Gibraltar um, after the British fort. It's, um, it's, it's on high ground. The Germans have all the observation. It's very well fortified, concrete bunkers, pillboxes. Um, and that has to fall in the first day in order for the attack at uh, Meuse Argonne to succeed. Um, it does fall uh, eventually, um, but of course it, it holds the advance up and uh, the terrain around it, the, the tangled undergrowth, the fallen trees, the bits of barbed wire. It's, um, it really means that it's impossible to keep the cohesion of, of units um, very much further than, uh, you, you know, cohesion of units breaks apart almost as soon as you leave the, uh, the front line trenches. Nick provides a comparison to imagine what this battle is like, and it's the closest to the wilderness, 1864. What does that mean, Nick? Well, obviously, the wilderness in 1864 is an example of the use of terrain to mask tactical in- inferiority or, or, um, that we see in the American Civil War, um, and that's something that um, the Germans also use. It's In terms of Meuse-Argonne is as close to a wilderness in France as you're going to get, and many of the American soldiers who, be, who look at the terrain and try and fight their way through this instinctively look back to 1864 and, and think, well, this is what it must have been like for, um, for Robert E. Lee's troops. The fight in Musangon goes on and the Americans bog down. In fact, the attack bogs down. And at this point, it begins to seem as if the Germans are forming up and they're stiffening their defense. It's not true, however, and we have to turn back to now the political matters that are going on. Just here at the close, before we turn to the final weeks of the war and how how Foch launches attacks again and again in September, there's no rest, into the end of the month of October. Is Hindenburg having an... uh, Is is Ludendorff having a nervous breakdown, and does Hindenburg see it? This has always been the controversy, the idea that um, Ludendorff loses control and loses his nerve, and I do think there's something in that. His behavior becomes increasingly erratic. Um, officers around him are so concerned about what's going on that they get a, an eminent German psychiatrist to come and see him. Hindenburg um, doesn't necessarily see this too much, um, or if he does, he's really content to let Ludendorff do his own thing. Um, however, when Ludendorff eventually tells him that the game is over, um, he listens. Hindenburg is a mystery to me, and the reason I want to conquer it is because he remains the dominant figure in German folklore until Hitler replaces him in 1933. Hindenburg's personality, was he deaf? Did, was he trained never to respond to massacre and loss? I can't read him, Nick. No, you, I think you make a very good point. He, he is very difficult often to penetrate the myth of the wooden titan, the great sort of iron-jawed um, general of legend. And in some ways, the, the, the Hindenburg myth, the victor of Tannenberg in 1914, when he, when he oversaw the crushing defeat of the Russians, um, he becomes a kind of what they call an ersatz Kaiser, a sort of substitute Kaiser. And actually trying to penetrate the man beneath this kind of iron myth is very, very difficult. He's obviously Prussian to the core. He's a man who's career has spanned the life of the German Second Reich, um, who has known little but decisive tactical and decisive military victory. Um, but I get the sus- suspicion now he's very much past his sell-by date. He's, he's increasingly, um, you know, increasingly leaves the, the day-to-day running of the army to Ludendorff um, and really loses that sense of what's actually happening on the battlefield. There are two American presidents reading the news, one of them participating in the battle, that's Harry Truman, another one watching this as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, that's Frank Roosevelt, and, of course, Woodrow Wilson back in Washington waiting for news. The Americans are bogged down in Meuse Argonne. The British to the north and the French to the center are increasingly launching offensives that are effective because the Germans are deteriorating as a fighting force. They're out of men. Some companies, Nick tells me, are down to 12 men. Some regiments have no one reporting. It's the flu, they're shirkers, they're running away, they're exhausted. We're going to turn, when we come back, to Woodrow Wilson because Wilson's notes, exchange of notes with the Kaiser and with Berlin, 
are as important on the battlefield as the barrages that follow. The book is 100 Days, the campaign that ended World War I. Nick Lloyd is the author. I'm John Batchelor.